am I? I am Ian Dees. Um, I have an email address and a Twitter account right there. Um, I also run, well, I also run a uh, organization called Map Minnesota, which does infrequent mapping parties using OpenStreetMap. Um, we haven't done one in a while with the, I've been out of town, but um, I encourage you to go to mapminnesota.org and check it out. Um, if you're interested, there's a uh, mailing list link on the on the right side that you could sign up for, and um, we'd be happy to help you answer any questions you have. Uh, so I'm going to go through some really simple things here. My goal is to give you a quick overview of what OpenStreetMap is, who's using it, and um, how you can use it uh, in your projects, and then more importantly, how to get uh, to the point where you can add your own data to OpenStreetMap. So while I'm talking about this stuff, if you guys have a laptop, I encourage you to go to OpenStreetMap.org and register for an account if you don't already have one. And then since I see lots of iPads here, I suggest that you skip over the second step. Um, but the, the main editor on the, on the OpenStreetMap website is in Flash. So if you have a laptop, it's pretty easy to uh, hop in there real quick and use the Flash editor. Um, there are other ways to do it, but that's what I'll probably touch on real quick today. All right, so um, for those of you that don't know, well, actually, who here knows what OpenStreetMap is? Awesome. And so then when I say the word GeoWiki, you probably kind of have an idea of what's going on there. Um, it's basically the Wikipedia for maps. Um, think that anybody, including you guys, could log on to OpenStreetMap and change the map where you live, anywhere, really, um, and make it more accurate. Um, you could, don't do this, but you could like delete the entire city of Minneapolis. Somebody would notice, but you could then go back and make it better. Um, there is a... Uh, I, I sometimes get a lot of questions about who runs the whole show, and there's a, uh, a foundation, a nonprofit that runs in, uh, in the UK that uh, collects money and then uses it to pay for hardware, basically. So that's, there's, there isn't really one group that is running the whole thing. Um, it's all volunteer-driven. Uh, there's just some fundraising that happens to pay for servers. Um, you might ask why we do this. Uh, none of us get paid. Um, even the people that spend almost all their time uh, keeping the servers up in the UK don't get paid to do this. Um, I, I don't know, really. Um, we're all crazy. Um, I, to, give some, to, to give some meaning behind that, though, um, it, back in the good old days, 2005 or so, um, there was a guy named Steve Coast who started OpenStreetMap because uh, there was no access to free and open data like we have here in the U.S. So he was kind of jealous about that. And, uh, sorry, free and open uh, geographic data like we have here in the U.S. Um, in, in the U.K., the government holds on to, actually the crown, holds on to all the copyright for the maps that the government creates there and they're required by law to sell them and make a profit. And so if you want to do some mapping in the UK with official maps from the government, you have to pay tens of thousands of British pounds to get even started on um, uh, using their data. Uh, so this guy made OpenStreetMap. It was basically a Rails app that uh, consisted of very simple um, skeleton website. And then he got a, a bunch of people together and went to map an island by handing out GPSs that he found and um, having them all walk or bike around a single island. I think it was uh, the Isle of Man, maybe. Um, so as that kind of grew in the UK and in Europe, um, the United States was looking really barren. So this guy imported all of the existing government data into OpenStreetMap. Um, that was back in 2007, and that really kind of lit up the map in the U.S., and uh, a lot more people 
we're starting to pay attention and fixing that uh, crummy government data. So last year we had 250,000 people, registered users. This year we have almost 600,000. Um, and over a rolling week average, we have about 7,000 people active. Um, so that's, that's quite a few people, uh, not as many as I would like, adding data on a daily basis um, to the OpenStreetMap database. As a result, uh, a bunch of commercial groups have come together and started using OpenStreetMap. Um, for example, you might have heard Apple. Um, we've determined by careful inspection of their data that the, the tiles that they use in iPhoto uh, are OpenStreetMap data in some places. Um, they don't give us attribution, which is kind of a, a problem, but um, other companies like Bing render their own tiles. Uh, MapQuest does the same thing. Geocaching.com uh, just last, actually in January, started using OpenStreetMap because Google Maps is starting to charge a large amount of money to uh, use their Google Maps API for heavy users. Um, so uh, for the, the techies in the audience, that's everybody, right? Um, a quick overview of, of the simple data model. Uh, this has been in place since um, the good old days when Steve Coast made the Rails app. He created these three primitives in Rails, and we've grown from there. So um, the first thing is a node. It's a simple point in space. That's pretty simple. Um, something like a... A uh, post office box or a uh, point of interest is a point, uh, is a node. A way is a ordered list of nodes, and so that forms a directed line. Um, so that could be a road. It could be a, if you uh, connect a, uh, a way back on itself, so like this corner piece here, if that was all one way, that would be a polygon, so you could make a square shape if you want. And then uh, we store metadata on these items using a tag, which is basically a key and a value. Um, it can be any key and any value. Um, you don't have to put, there, there is no schema, there is no um, reference that you have to use. Um, there is a, a, a list of known keys and values that we've kind of settled on over the last five or six years. Um, so for example, there's a, a name key that has the name of the road or the name of the business. Um, there's a, a highway which signifies what kind of road it is. So in this case, the red one I'm calling a, a residential road, so something that might go through a subdivision. <clears throat> and then uh, down here there's a secondary road which might be like the road that uh, Best Buy is on here. And then there's this kind of esoteric thing called a relation, which is um, a grouping of any of those things. So um, you can use that to make uh, bike routes or bus routes, for example, where it's a group of, of roads that all have a, a thing in common. So with those things, I know I said three, the relation you don't really need to worry about if you're developing on OpenStreetMap data. Um, with those things, you can do anything you want with OpenStreetMap data. Um, in order to get OpenStreetMap data, you go to planet.osm.org. Oh, that's neat. And here you can see that there's a 21 gigabyte XML file. Actually, it's compressed. If you un uncompress it, it's I think it's about 90 gigabytes right now. Um, but one of these comes out every week. You can go back in time and get an older one if you want. Um, but basically, that's the entire planet. Um, there's other ways of getting the data, like uh, you can get, there's a guy in Germany who has extracted different countries' worth of data. So if you just want to get Minnesota, for example, there's a state um, there's a state file for it, and it's 
200 megabytes. So that's a lot easier than dealing with the entire country, or the entire planet, sorry. Um, so it's one big XML file, and that XML file has, an X, has representations of the nodes, ways, and relations, and the tags in them. And you can um, use existing tools to parse that XML file into databases. Um, you can make pretty HTML representations of it, or you can use your own parsing uh, tools to make some routing tool that you want to use for your um, Coburn's Delivers company, for example. Um, you can also, as a, as a consumer, you can just view the map if you want. Um, OpenStreetMap.org has a, a map on, it, on the front page. Um, we've begun to stress that this is mainly for developers and mappers. Um, this isn't meant to be a replacement for maps.google.com. So um, although there is a search box here, it doesn't perform as well as Google Maps search. Um, and there isn't a, for example, an, a uh, create your own map functionality, like a, a, your own pin and line drawing thing. There's other tools that let you do that. But this particular web page is meant for mappers to come in and say, um, oh yeah, look, I just added this uh, bike path here along the river, and it just showed up, and it, that's how I expect it to look. So um, keep that in mind. If you're a mobile developer, for example, there are limits to how you can use this particular layer um, in your mobile app. There was a, a mobile developer who stuck this layer into their new shiny iOS app and took our servers down because he sold like a million and a half copies of his app, and everybody went and hit our servers at the same time. So. Um, we've become a little more careful about that, but keep that in mind. There are definitely other places that you can go that are just as free. Um, it's just that this is specific to mappers. Um, and like I said, click, there we go. Um, for example, MapQuest is probably one of the more popular ones. They recently, well, okay, not recently anymore. Last year, they started um, using OSM data in their open product. They have tiles that you can use with basically no limit, um, and they look pretty darn good, too. Um, they have a search. They have a directions thing. So open.mapquest.com is a lot more like maps.google.com, but it uses OpenStreetMap data. Let's see if I can do directions real quick here. Yeah. So actually, that's a good question. What they're doing is um, they, we, OpenStreetMap um, distributes minutely diffs uh, of the entire planet. So every minute, a new file gets created that contains the, um, let me show you real quick. going to work. Windows are not happy today. Let's see. So here in this directory, there it, it's pretty empty right now because we're going through a license change. But each of these files here represents one minute's worth of changes. And so you, there's, there's tools that you can use to take these files and apply them to an existing database and keep yours up to date. And um, one of the database schemas you can use is to query the data natively. So um, you can get information about the XML elements. Um, another is to use that for rendering. And that's what these MapQuest guys are doing is they have a rendering database that stays up to date minutely. Um, actually, I think it might be 15 minutes now just because they are serving a lot more traffic now. But um, the idea is that this is getting updated 
at least four times an hour. Yeah? Sure. Uh, so the question was, how is the data represented on the, in the database? Um, the, the projection we're using is WGS84. It's latitude, longitude. Um, when, we're, when we show it on the screen here, it's in uh, uh, Web Mercator, just like uh, Google Maps tiles. Um, they're only using latitude, longitude. We, we are sticking with 2D because uh, GPS historically wasn't very, hasn't been very good with altitude. Um, when, unless you want to spend a lot of money to get altitude precision. So um, there are ways of, actually this is a good spot right here, there are ways of, um, of specifying height, relative height. So like this, the 35W bridge goes over the railroad here, and so you can sort of see, they don't do a very good job of it, but you can see that the highway is above the, the road, at least in the rendering. Uh, let's see, where was I going here? So, yeah, open.mapquest.com open does um, directions. It does point of interest lookup, all based on OpenStreetMap data. Why? Because they're getting clobbered by maps.google.com, and they don't want to pay for... So, okay, all right, here we go, mapquest.com. If you go to mapquest.com, which is their commercial site, and you look down in the corner, wow, presentation is clobbering my view. Right there in this really easy view, maybe if I move the city out of the way, you can see where it says portions copyright Navtech. And Navtech is a competitor to them. And so they're depending on this company that they're paying millions of dollars a year to to, give the, to get this data. And not only are they paying for it, they're paying a lot for it. It takes two years to get updates to MapQuest, and um, it's usually wrong. So um, OpenStreetMap is, is a win on all accounts for them. Um, they're not happy with the routability. The, the, connect, the connection of the graph in the US, so it's not the default. But in places like Germany, for example, it's a lot better, and they're starting to switch over to using OpenStreetMap exclusively. Um, also because the Navtech data in Europe is really bad, even worse than here. Yeah, so most of what happens is um, monetary. So MapQuest will, uh, they gave some money to the OpenStreetMap Foundation a few years ago. Um, they gave some money to the OpenStreetMap US Foundation um, to kind of build up the goal being to improve the map in the US. Um, and we're slowly getting there. With all this press from Apple and MapQuest and Bing and everything, um, and bigger audiences every year in Minibar, for example. Um, we're getting more people interested in it, and um, the, the important thing is that there's thousands of people that log on and get to the point where they add a single point or change a road because the road doesn't exist yet because it was just built last year. And that's kind of what we're looking for, is people like you guys that know your area really well and have 15 minutes of spare time to go in and, and mark your road. Um, and that's, I mean, lots of people doing that is what will make our data the best. So um, not only can you do the maps.google thing, but because you can have access to the raw data, um, you can do cool things like this guy, um, he did 8-bit cities. And you probably saw for uh, April Fools, Google Maps copied this basically verbatim, which is really annoying. And um, and so this guy basically rasterized all of the data and 
stuck cool little sprites on there. Um, I don't think they have many applets in here yet. Nope. But um, yeah, so the, this guy um, is a very good example of being able to have access to that data and do whatever the heck you want with it. Um, there's also uh, this this one. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Pavray, but it's a, a 3D ray tracing engine. And this guy wrote a script that takes OpenStreetMap data and converts it into the, the language of Pavray, which generates these cool ray traced images that you can then apply textures to and um, do some pretty cool things with. Um, and then this one is, oh, we changed the link. Crap. Um, this one is pretty cool because it is related to uh, Nice Ride Minnesota, which just opened this past week. Um, so there's this guy goes around and collects real-time data for a bunch of the bike share. Uh, oh, it's not going to work. That's sad. Anyway, it's real-time, uh, up-to-the-minute information about the um, the bike stations in Minneapolis, all 160 of them or whatever. And um, it's pretty cool because he, he made his own tiles for the background so that it's a lot easier to see the, the pins where the stations are. If you use something like Google Maps, it would have been this weird high contrast thing and you wouldn't have been able to do the artistic things that this guy wanted to do. Um, and then there's uh, this guy, these guys out in California that do really pretty things with maps. Um, they just came out with this uh, maps.stamen.com thing. They made three styles that are based on OpenStreetMap data. This one in the background here is um, a response to the Google Maps terrain layer. And it, um, there's a lot of custom work in here to make the labels be placed in the right spot and the highway shields and, and um, picking out the road names right. I think they even uh, had a custom font uh, created for this. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you can do. Um, there's this one here that is meant to go away. That's meant to uh, be printed out, so it's completely back, black and white, one bit. Um, and then there's this one, which is my favorite, the watercolor style. And I think they have a. If you go to their website, um, they have a, a pretty extensive description of how they made this. But it involves lots of um, masking layers and rendering with different filters. It's pretty cool. Um, so there is a lot more to the data that you can do than just plotting it on a, on a square and showing cool pictures. Um, all right. Um, and so not only can you view the data uh, on your web browser, but you can use it um, in emergency situations. Um, Back in 2010, when Haiti had their earthquake, um, the only available road data was OpenStreetMap. And um, it improved. Let's see, do I have a picture? Nope. Darn. Um, it, it was basically uh, four of the main roads in Port-au-Prince. And that was the entire country of Haiti. Uh, and then the earthquake happened, and then it was completely mapped within 24 hours because hundreds of mappers came together using donated imagery from places like Digital Globe, the people that do satellite imagery. Um, because we had before and after images of the city and of the entire country, the mappers were able to mark buildings that were destroyed, bridges that were demolished, and then were able to create a, a map that people could put on their GPS and carry it with them on the flight over to Haiti to do search and rescue. And um, they were able to use that map to make sure that they could route to the next hospital if they were carrying somebody that was hurt. Um, and th that had never been done before. That kind of revolutionized how people thought about crisis response and being able to 
uh, react to disasters quickly. Um, unfortunately, um, the only reason that that really worked well in Haiti was because nobody cares about the data. I mean, that's kind of harsh, but there, there wasn't a lot of money to be made in, in selling the Haiti data. In places like Japan and Libya even, there is a lot more business interest in, for example, Digital Globe um, didn't want to give us imagery in the same way that they, that they did for Haiti for these two places because of security and money concerns. And so we weren't able to react to the same way, which is really frustrating. But um, we did what we could. We, we mapped uh, the coastline of Japan when that tsunami hit. We showed um, the water inundation areas so that people stayed off of that highway that got uh, washed out, for example. So um, it, this is something that in the last couple of years has really set OSM apart as, as being um, a very fast-acting uh, crisis response tool. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, I mean, I did. Um, there were people in Germany. Yeah. So what basically what happened was um, there was a mailing list post that said that there was an earthquake in Haiti. Um, five or six hours later, there was a, a link that you could add to your editor for getting the base, the satellite imagery. And then another 12 hours later, it was another one so that you could get the before and after. And um, so those are the tools that people use to what we, what we call trace the roads. Um, we, we didn't get the names of the roads, for example, because we can't see those. But um, that kind of gave an, a, a rough base map for people to, to um, route with. And then later on, um, there's, a, there's a group called Humanitarian Open Street Map Team that went down there uh, with funding from World Bank and finish the job, basically. They, um, there's now a team of 50 or 60 people that used to be employed by the ha Haitian uh, uh, GIS department, basically, the government agency that did maps. And they're now editing OpenStreetMap. And it's one of the more active areas in OpenStreetMap now, just because people are adding water spouts and bathrooms and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so Yeah, so they Yeah, so that that's one of the organizations that kind of sprung up out of this is um there's an organization that that came together and they made this really cool web app that um like Haitians could send a text message to a short code because that's, that was one of the only forms of communication that was still active at the time, was sending text messages. And so they would send a text message, um, then it would get translated from Haitian or Creole to English, and then people in, in Boston and New York in these crisis mapping parties where they were all sitting around a campfire out in the backyard of somebody's house, um, all on the same Wi-Fi, would... Uh, try and get that person help, which is pretty cool. Um, and they would respond uh, by hitting reply in the email, and it would get translated back into Creole and get sent back to that person within half an hour or so. Um, and so that was pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of um, applications for OSM like that, which is pretty cool to see. Um, not something I could have even imagined back when I started this. Um, so. I don't remember when this ends, but I imagine I'm running short on time. Does anybody know? Yeah, a long time. Sure, yeah. Yeah.
And, and also in China, where it's illegal to map, um, people are mapping um, because they can. And OpenStreetMap isn't popular enough yet to be blocked by the China, Chinese government. So that's, that's a, yeah, that, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I have 12 minutes. All right, so let me whip through. Um, I'll come back to showing an edit real quick here. But um, so one of the most common questions I get at the end of these is, um, what happens when I go and delete an entire road or um, somebody vandalizes uh, the city of Minneapolis by deleting all the buildings? Um, there are several tools that you can use to keep track of an area. You get an RSS feed or an email whenever something changes. Um, it's not working right now, otherwise I'd show it to you. But um, it's basically a tool that divides the entire world up into little squares and you can pick which squares you want to get notifications about. And so I have one set up for Minneapolis, one set up for St. Paul, and I get emails whenever somebody changes something. And so I see probably five or ten of these every day or two, and I go and check it out, and I say, ah, yes, that, that did in fact get realigned, or you know, there, um, there's kind of a small project to keep up to date with the central corridor light rail. Um, that that's kind of, um, that entire thing is showing up as it's getting constructed with the tag construction equals yes. And so as soon as that thing opens, the entire geometry of that will be there and ready to route if you want to use that in your tool. But sometimes it slips through the fin our fingers. For example, this road in uh, Illinois, somebody named Little Egypt Expressway, um, it, it was a bypass for El Dorado, Illinois, and it went past New Haven. Um, but somebody discovered that it doesn't actually exist. Um, oh, that link doesn't work. But the point is that there is no tool or there is no review process like Google has. Um, I haven't mentioned it at all, but Google has their own version of this um, called MapMaker where it's very frustrating to do anything because every change you have to make, uh, every change you make has to be reviewed by somebody else. And um, I was trying to change the cycle path around the lakes to be one way and have a 10 mile per hour speed limit. And that took a week and I did it in tw 20 seconds in OpenStreetMap. And so I kind of gave up on that. Um, but anyway, the point is somebody discovered this, they, it got posted to the mailing list for talk or for the United States and uh, we fired up the imagery and we saw that this road didn't actually exist so we went and deleted it and scolded the user that did it. Actually they thought it was a, a, a prank, kind of like they were mapping their own fictional world kind of thing, which we get sometimes. Um, and so we told them this is actually the real world that we're trying to represent <laughs> and not some fake world. I mean, I, we've seen kids actually log in and like start drawing houses as if it was a paint program. And I mean, we, we you know, thanks, but there's a development server for that. You can do that over there. Um, so anyway, that, that kind of covers everything um, that I had. Let me show off real quick how easy it is to make an edit to OpenStreetMap. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, so um, not only is it frustrating, but Google Maps, um, they retain a uh, non-ending license to your contribution. Um, they don't actually own your data, but they won't give it back to you um, if you ask them and there isn't any other way to get it. So essentially, yeah, they own your data and um, that's just not nice of them. Um, on the other hand, it is nice because then you can use it on your phone. It shows up a week later as being a new route that you can draw, draw uh, route on, and it'll show up in Google Maps if you change a phone number or something. But OpenStreetMap is just cooler. Yeah. Yeah. So let me. 
Yeah, so we've got the good night, the greatest good night ever. Um, so the, the editor that I'm about to show you that's in Flash is very simple. You hit the edit button up at the top. First you have to have Wi-Fi. There it goes. It loads up this thing. There's a list of, of, of points points of interest, for example. There's a handy-dandy introduction video guide here, which I advise you to read if you haven't edited OpenStreetMap before. And um, at its simplest, this is a drag and drop operation. So you can drag the supermarket onto the map. And there you go. You've just made a change to OpenStreetMap, sort of. You have to quick. You have to save it by hitting this button up here. Um, and I'm not going to save the supermarket and the driving circle of the parking lot here. But, um, yeah, <laughs> right. So once you have put a point there, you can put a name on it. You can put an address, um, that sort of thing. So that kind of gives you a, a very quick idea of what it's like to edit OpenStreetMap. Um, that's, uh, that's accessible as soon as you log in with the account that you just created. But as we have mentioned, Flash is falling asleep slowly. So there is a Java OpenStreetMap editor, which is a little bit more heavyweight and can really get you in there quick. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the problems with satellite imagery is that it's really expensive and it's really big. So those are things that um, open source software doesn't really deal with very well. Not software, but uh, organizations don't deal with that very well. Um, and so we're, we're using Bing because it, they already have it and they licensed it to us. Um, there are free alternatives. It's just not as good. Um, so um, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute where they are, though. So in, in JOSM, or Java OpenStreetMap Editor, there's a download button up here. Um, I'm assuming that you can download the jar file and run it if you have uh, a JDK on your uh, device. Once you do that, you can select an area to download. This is going to go talk to the API server and it grabs the, the OSM data for that region that you just selected. Um, this looks pretty plain, um, but what you can do is open up your GPS file that you just walked. Uh, the parking lot, for example, you, you walked the border of the parking lot. If you didn't have imagery, you could open that file up in here and it would show up as a dotted line um, on the map that you could then trace with, with editor. But the more common thing to do is to fire up a, an imagery layer. Um, at, as, as we said, Bing is an option. Um, they're usually pretty good. They're not free as in free, though, free with a capital F. So there is a government-issued imagery. Apparently not this far south, though. That's disappointing. Um, another one is the Hennepin County imagery. There we go. Um, so that seeking out imagery is rather difficult and time intensive and technical process. That's why we kind of fall back on Bing. Um, but there are um, the local municipalities, your county, your state even, and in some cases, the country will have uh, imagery that you can use um, with just a, a URL added to your preferences file here. You can use that as a background layer and, and draw over it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there, there is legal question about whether tracing over imagery is creating a derivative work. 
we tend to stay, OSM tends to stay on the side of um, that it is. And so tracing over copyrighted imagery, like um, tracing over imagery that we don't have a license for. How about that? That's a better way of saying it. Um, because Bing is copyrighted, but they said that we can, and there's a document somewhere that says we can. Whereas Google, uh, in a lot of places, uses the same data from Digital Globe, or the same imagery, but we don't have a license to draw over it. So um, in the same way that you can't draw over it, you can't have Google Maps open on one side of your screen and have the editor open in the other, because that's kind of, it, it could be construed as copying from one source to the other, which would be bad, because we're trying to keep it our data as clean as possible. Did you have a question? Sure. Yeah, so um, the, the API is pretty well documented um, on our wiki. There's basically um, getters and posts for the three different kinds of primitives. There's also, more importantly, a, a map call, which is basically here's a bounding box, a region that you want to get data for, and it will build a OSM XML file for that specific region so that you don't have to go get the entire planet. And that, when, when the editor here, when I clicked on that download button and selected an area, that's what that call was doing. There's also a, a complementary upload that the thing is using when, it, when you want to finish your edit session. Um, there is geocoding. It's not very good, though. Um, mostly because adding addresses is pretty tricky. Um, does anybody know the address here? I don't. I'll use my old address. Wow, that didn't work. That worked. So the only reason that search worked is because I bothered to go through and put building or put house numbers on all the buildings in my neighborhood. Um, it works for more general queries, like Minneapolis, because there's a polygon that um, encompasses all of Minneapolis. And so the thing need, knows that it can look there. Yeah? Um, so the way that, so remember the tagging system that I talked about earlier? The way that we put in addresses is basically the house number, the street, and the city, and the postcode. So it, they're, they're separated out somewhat. Um, there are tools that can know that all the buildings along 4th Street Southeast are all on the same street. Um, but that's assuming that somebody has put in the addresses for all those. Um, so we would probably go, our philosophy is map what's on the ground. And so we would probably go with what we see when we took a picture, when we walked past. And so if somebody made a change to the XML data that put 400 before 300 on the wrong way or something, we would probably say that that's wrong because, I mean, I guess it depends on what the, the um, there is there is no automatic detection of address problems right now. Yeah. Um, anything that we can't see. So um, I mean there are there are borders like 
um, the border of a national park, for example. Although we can't see them, we've imported them, but I personally don't really like them in there because I can't walk up to the border and say, there it is right there, and get it with my GPS. So that, I mean, anything, um, street lights, stop signs, houses, police, anything, yeah. One last question. One thing. Thank you.